Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of College Hockey Talk. On today's podcast, I am joined by a two-time national champion from the Wisconsin Badgers women's hockey team, Nicole Lamantia. Welcome to the podcast, Nicole, and thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. Now, my first question to you is, how does it feel to be a two-time national champion, and has that feeling sunk in yet for you? Um, it has in its ways. I think this one was definitely – um, more exciting and more surreal just given the circumstances and how much we gave up and uh, things like that all season. I think the first one was so special because it was my first year there, but this one was pretty surreal and I think topped it by a few miles just because it was just craziness all year and you never really knew going in the rink if you were playing, practicing, if we were getting shut down. So it was nice definitely to get it done and so relieving. Yeah, definitely. Are you going to introduce yourself in that way from now on, two-time national champion? <laughs> or, are you, or are you just going no. to stick by just basic intros, I guess? Yeah, I'll stick to the basics. Hopefully I can uh, ramp up my intro eventually at the end of my uh, graduation date, too. Definitely, definitely. Well, how, how have you guys tried to celebrate uh, the championship win? I've seen a few videos, but it seems like it's been a little bit less than it usually is because of the pandemic. Yeah, we, um, we've tried to just parade around Madison with the trophy, let like fans and different students and things interact with it and see it. But obviously there's not as many people around and when there's big crowds and us just wandering the streets, people are a little more hesitant to, you know, come take pictures and come see everything. So that's been kind of unfortunate, but obviously still just as fun, just going around and going around the city, taking pictures by the Capitol and stuff with the trophy is always fun. But it's nice to still be able to do things like that outside, definitely. Yeah, no, and you also had to. You also participated in the USA uh, d- uh, national team camp in Minnesota. What was that like for yourself? Um, it was definitely a learning experience. I think um, the depth always at those uh, USA camps is something special, and not that our compete level is any different, but it just makes it that more surreal competing with people that you don't really compete with day in and day out at the rink. And uh, they always bring their A game there. So it was a really good learning experience to, like, learn from people that I don't normally play with and get to know their habits and things they do on and off the ice to be elite. Now, what was your thoughts on Maddie Rooney's stack pad save? That was pretty cool video that came out from that <laughs> camp. Yeah, that was pretty special. It was pretty cool to watch it. She's a special player and definitely not surprised, though. Mm-hmm. Now, is it a bit awkward doing that camp like a week after the season ended? Because obviously there's some Northeastern players there. There are other WCHA rivals there as well. Is it a bit awkward seeing them after just competing with them for a national title? Um, I think the first day there's like a little bit of like um, awkwardness. I would say a little bit of shyness just because everyone's like saying congrats and different things. And then like you realize also that they're still standing there and they still wanted it just as bad. So I think that element of it is a little awkward, but after the first day, like kind of everyone washes it out just because everyone's trying to compete for a roster spot. And what you did like last week really doesn't matter to anybody else there. Now you had to deal with a lot of obstacles due to the pandemic because uh, for the season, what was the secret through getting, getting through all those challenges that your team faced? Um, I think definitely just managing our our weekends and our time away from the rink was definitely the biggest thing. We had like a little hiccup there after we traveled. And um, I think from there, we kind of just like tightened everything up and just made sure like we were staying in our inner circles and our apartments and things like that. And if there wasn't a need to go eat out or go sit at a restaurant or something, if that was avoidable, that's something that um, we needed to avoid and sacrifice, which at times was difficult, especially like um, I think it was like midway through the second half, we got to have parents finally at Le bon. And so that was like so relieving, but obviously like your first instinct after the game is to go have dinner with them or things like that. And since they weren't on our testing regiment, that was kind of something we had to refrain from, which was pretty difficult because we obviously all wanted to see our families really bad, especially when they're literally in Madison with us. It's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had to deal with a lot of schedule changes uh, very much during the beginning of the year. Your team missed a lot of games. I guess, how did you mentally stay prepared for all those changes and postponements to your schedule? And what was the key for maintaining flexibility for this year? Yeah, I think probably the main component of just staying focused was just bringing everything every day because um, learning from last year, like walking in the locker room, thinking we are going to play that quarterfinal game with no fans and then 
them just cutting it off. Like you really went into every day with a positive attitude, just thinking like we are going to play and like everything's on the line every day. So um, that definitely helped me focus and be ready for anything because you really never knew if they were going to try and jam anything, you know, during a weekday or something. And that was obviously something we would have loved to do if that's what we needed to do at that point. And just being flexible, I think like classes and things being online definitely made it more e like easier on us in terms of flexibility with like missing out on things. But um, yeah, I just think being ready for anything at all times because last year we never knew it was going to be cut off and then you kind of walked in and you're like, oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I guess like how do you try to deal with the COVID aspect of being a hot college hockey player? Because everyone really focus on, focuses on the academic part of being a college hockey player and obviously the hockey part, but you also have the COVID aspect in the back of your mind, especially for this year. How did you try to deal with that? Yeah, I think it was difficult. Um, just thinking of the pandemic in the back of my head, I had um, my grandparents actually both get it. My grandpa's in the hospital the week before Thanksgiving for almost 25 days and um, is still on oxygen till this day. So, um, you know, dealing with the pandemic and not having them there and not, uh, not having them really know what's going on was really tough and it kind of made it that more surreal to me to like take it seriously and help those around me to be like hey like we need to take it serious and this isn't something that we can mess around with just because we're younger and maybe it won't affect us as much but and especially just like having my grandpa really sick was just really hard to go to the rink every day sometimes like worrying about his health and how the pandemic was really affecting my family personally. Now, you also had to share the Bon Arena with the men's team. Was that like a change for your team as well? Yeah, definitely. They usually typically practice on our ring for a little bit um, when we were when they're in the cold, but um, they never practiced that length of time on the same sheet as us. And some game days we overlapped and stuff. Thank God we on those days we played before them because the ice was pretty ripped up usually after they would practice for two, three hours before us. But um, it was definitely cool, like getting closer with the men's team and, you know, being able to watch more of their games and stuff because we didn't have any conflicts really because we are using the same sheet. So that was really nice. Now, was it also an adjustment not having any fans in the stands at Le bon? And how did you adjust to that? Because I've never been to Le bon, but all the players from Madison and everyone who's been there before say it's the best uh, atmosphere in college hockey. Yeah, it is by far the best atmosphere. We have the best fans in the country by far. Um, I think it was really difficult. Obviously, our freshmen, it was a lot easier because they don't really know the experience yet. But usually you can't really hear yourself think during the game and especially like during the anthem and stuff like you really can't hear anything just because it's so loud in there. It's really no time for it. So that definitely was hard because it's easy to get in your own head when everything's so silent and then looking around and seeing nobody there, I think was difficult at times just because like coming to Wisconsin everyone knows like we get fans and things like that and that's something we look forward to so coming out of the tunnel and not seeing anyone kind of sunk at times but I mean we got used to it. Yeah and I guess like are you excited for the possibility of fans coming back next year especially since you guys just won the national championship I'm assuming the house is going to be even more packed than usual. Yeah I'm, I'm hoping especially at least for the banner raising the first day or first game I should say that um, we'll be able to pack it in and we'll hopefully have everybody there. I know uh, the start of sophomore year when we did that, that was really special and something I really loved about my experience so far at Wisconsin. So I'm hoping that we get all the fans in the world at that game. Now, what's it like being a player at Le bon and just the experiencing the atmosphere on the ice? Because like I said before, I've never been there before, but the Badger fans are pretty, pretty awesome. You know, they're very passionate about your team. And I've seen some social media people um, – highlighting some of the Badger fans it's awesome just how much how much they really care about your team yeah the fans are definitely engaging there was a few actually that made the road trip out to um Erie for us just once we made the championship and found you know tickets wherever and picked them up and the fans are really special they definitely care about us and love to come up to us and stuff after the games and um they definitely like fans have like interacted with my parents and they'll go out and stuff with my parents which is nice like having so many people support us outside our own families is really cool and definitely an experience not everyone gets either. Now, 3-3 three three overtime was also introduced to college hockey this year. As a defenseman, what was it like having more space on the ice and having more opportunities to create offensive chances for your teammates, especially since you guys have a lot of great forwards with a lot of speed and skill? 
Yeah, I think it was special. I think being an offensive defenseman, three on three definitely like plays into my style of play. So I personally really enjoy it. And I feel like it gives me an opportunity to um, show like my forward aspects and things like that. And uh, I think definitely with our power forwards and so many goal scorers on our team, it's really easy to get on man rushes and things like that during, during three on three and kind of expose the other teams. And obviously Daryl's buried a few goals like that. So it's been really nice being on the ice or being with her and things like that when she's scored. How do you try to stay defensively minded in some of those situations? Because if you make one little defensive mistake, it can cause an odd man rush for the other team. So what's your secret for staying defensively minded, but also having that knack to get the offensive chances happening? Um, I would say just trust my gut instinct. Like usually if I think I'm going to go and I want to go and I go and I'm 100% all in on a pinch or something like that, um, I usually feel like when I'm confident, I tend to not get beat as much, but that little hesitation usually cost me whether it's me or a forward or anybody else on the ice and whether that's even three on three or five on five but I feel like that's the most times when we kind of get caught and give up those odd man opportunities when we aren't really trusting ourselves and we have that little bit of hesitation that we don't normally have. What's the key for I guess trying to maintain uh, possession of the puck because that's the key part of three and three overtime especially in the offensive zone because you want to sustain offensive pressure but you also want to make line changes for your team as well and not have the opponent make line changes as well is it something you guys try to work on during practice? Yeah we definitely practice three on three I would say at least once a week just three on three scrimmages which is pretty competitive given um, the goal scores and things on our roster I feel like we usually rack up the score in three on three during our practices but just being able to like use the net and create time and space from the other team and give your teammates an opportunity to change um, definitely helps, you know, swinging back when you don't see an on-man rush and just managing your space and time is pretty effective during three on three. But I would say using the net and just being able to get one of their players to make a dumb mistake and come behind the net so then you can beat them up the ice is definitely to your advantage usually. Now, what was your biggest improvement you've made to your game this year compared to your sophomore year? Um, I would say just being more accountable in the defensive zone. I feel like my man-on-man -man coverage got a lot better, and I was able to get uh, more like sticks on pucks and things like that in front of the net. I feel like freshman and sophomore year, I didn't really know how to use my small size in the best way, and I feel like I kind of like grew into my body on the ice and was able to like know like I'm not going to bump people off the puck, but I have a way like I there's a better way to get in their way and make sure I'm picking up sticks to use myself to my advantage. Now, to start off the tournament run you guys had, you won the WCHA championship, beating Ohio State in overtime. What was your reaction when Lacey got that overtime goal, and what did you take away from that entire league tournament overall? Yeah, that moment was really special. I was super happy for her, you know, transferring in and everything. It kind of came full circle, and she's a really special player, so that was really fun to see her score, and the celebration and everything was really relieving, and obviously losing last year to Ohio State wasn't fun, so – being able to finish the job this year was more special. And then um, I think it just, that whole tournament just kind of made you realize like it's all or nothing. Like obviously the Gophers didn't get a NCAA tournament berth, even though they were a really good team that just shows like how competitive the NCAA women's side is getting and um, how important every single game is. And especially in our league who has a bunch of top teams and is really tight. I think it just makes it that more important to win day in and day out. Yeah, and I guess, like, did you use that game last year against Ohio State as motivation coming into this year's WCHA tournament? Um, yeah, it was definitely on a lot of our minds. Obviously, that was a feeling that stuck with us, given that it was the last game we played that year. So that really stunk. And um, not having the ability to come back and, like, beat them in the NCAA tournament or play them or, like, move on from that game kind of stunk. So it definitely stuck with us. Now, what was it like adding Lacey to the team mid-year? And how did she – how was – talk about the impact she made uh, to your team and just the whole freshman class. Yeah, it was awesome adding her. Um, she gels with our team really well off the ice and obviously on the ice. She's a huge asset for our team and is a great player. She sees the ice well and is a huge goal scorer for us. So her production definitely made a huge impact for us. But off the ice, I feel like she brings, you know, good habits and a good leadership presence. And definitely our whole freshman – class contributed and was super helpful and brought top caliber talent which is expected of them given what they did in high school they're all really special players in high school too so um, obviously we all expected them to do the same as they did and 
Um, like McKenna showing up so huge for us in the NCAA tournament was super awesome and super happy for her, but not surprised, honestly. She's super special player off the ice too. So um, happy for her to say the least and well-deserving for sure. Yeah, definitely. Another another two players that really stood out to me from your freshman class were Casey O'Brien and Maddie Wheeler on that third line. I thought they played really well and gave you guys a lot of offensive depth. Yeah, I think Casey definitely is a huge impact player and she's definitely a lot more accountable in the D zone. And I think that she's getting more confident and comfortable, which is awesome. And obviously she had a few breaks in that championship game that she would have loved to bury, but just getting those opportunities just shows like how special a player she is and how good she played all year and especially in that game she played really well and then um, Maddie Wheeler has great vision and she um, didn't get as many opportunities I don't think um, during the beginning of the year but definitely towards the end she did and she deserved them and she played really well and especially in that final game she was a huge piece of winning. Yeah what type of leadership did you want to bring to the team and were you more of a vocal or lead by example type of player? Um, I think I just like to bring like a calming presence and um, I'll be the type of person to be vocal and just be do things like that in the locker room but usually I let our leadership group kind of handle things and obviously there's juniors and seniors who don't wear letters that are big parts of our team so they obviously are contribute and say things when they need to be said but we all kind of just reiterate the same thing just to support each other and especially during the tournament. I think just being vocal, all of us who have been there and uh, won before, like handling nerves and things like that is probably the most thing that we talked about, especially myself. Like that was co my biggest contribution, I think, off the ice in terms of leadership was just knowing that I've been there before and being able to help the people that haven't because it is a really nerve wracking experience and it's really easy to like get in your head and things like that on the ice. Uh, what was your mindset heading into the tournament this year compared to your freshman year? Um, I think I just had the same expectation, honestly, was just leave it all out there and um, you don't want to come home empty handed was honestly the biggest thing for me, especially given what we went through this year. That was the last thing I wanted to do was come home empty handed. Mm -hmm. And I guess like uh, you were talking about how a team like Minnesota didn't make the tournament this year. And even though they're a top five ranked team, do you think the tournament should be expanded to 12 or 10 teams? Yeah, I think in the future, it's definitely um, going to be, I think, more of a route that they should go, given the talent. I think women's hockey is growing at an incredible pace, and I think the talent's really spreading across the NCAA, and there's so many new teams in the top 10 every year that there's so many teams that can hang with anybody, and every game's, you know, depending on bounces and things, you never know who's going to win that day. So I think expanding the tournament, given the talent levels increase so much, it's definitely something they should look to do in the future yeah especially since the ivy leagues didn't even play this year so that you just add like another two or three teams in that top 10 mix and there's like potentially 10 teams that can make the tournament and only eight so i agree with you on that i think that would be interesting if they add more teams i guess the argument against is that it's kind of nice that it makes it harder to get in the tournament which makes the games better i guess like what's your reaction to that news or to that uh, opinion yeah, I think definitely the biggest thing for me in regards to just like keeping it small and keeping it you know, the best teams is the WCHA this year, like had four top caliber teams in the country. And obviously it's really hard when there's only eight teams to put half of our league in the NCAA tournament. So I think just in terms of that, like expanding it really is the only way to go. And it's unfortunate that, you know, it seems odd to have four teams from our league out of the eight, but I think that the Gophers definitely deserve to be in the tournament and, um, I think expanding it is really the only thing that they can do to make it more even because they definitely deserve to be in it. But I understand, you know, having half our league in there is pretty difficult to do as well. Now, what was the atmosphere like at the tournament games compared to your freshman year? Because obviously the red carpet experience wasn't there as it used to be. And then obviously it was only like 25% of fans were in the building. So I guess like what was the atmosphere like and how did you adjust to it? Yeah, the atmosphere was definitely different. Um, obviously, we had, as I said, a bunch of fans come. So they, you know, cheered and had their banners and things like that, which was really fun and really nice. And you could definitely hear them. But we had a uh, police escort on the way there as well as Northeastern, which that kind of made things a little bit more special, at least and a little different, just so we knew. But um, obviously, once you got into the rink, like no one was really close to the glass or anything like that. So that aspect of it was definitely different. And then looking around, 
Um, you know, there's a lot more empty seats than full seats, but it made it easier to spot your parents after we won and things like that, which was cool. Now, in your first game of that tournament, you played Providence. What challenges did that team bring? And talk about the team's defensive performance, because I don't think Providence had a shot on goal until like the second period. And obviously playing a team like Providence, you don't usually play them in the regular season. So how did you like game plan for them? Yeah, I think Providence definitely was really good in their D zone and uh, their goalie played really well that day also. I'll give her credit. We put a lot of shots on her and uh, it was hard to get them through. But I think just going into the game, we watched film and um, being able to capitalize on their weaknesses and using our speed to our advantage around their D and things like that were things we talked about. And then, um, you know, going into the game, just not taking them lightly, like we haven't seen them or played them and we can look you know, up and down at the stats and how they've done against teams that we've played and things like that. But at the end of the day, like anything can happen at the tournament. So that was kind of our focus was to just not let off the gas at all. You then played Ohio State again in the Frozen Four. How did that game compare to the when you played them in the WCHA final? Um, I think the one at um, the NCAA tournament was a lot more intense, although uh, I think it was really difficult. I think most of the game we were on our heels and um, Kennedy, our goalie, stood on our head that game and definitely kept us in the game. I think we could have easily gone the other way if she wasn't playing as well as she did. And we had so many bounces. I remember being on the ice in the first period, the puck hitting uh, a stanchion in the glass and shooting out in the middle of the slot for a breakaway for them. And Kennedy just saved it and was ready for it and so calm and confident. So I think just having her in the net made it a lot more calm but um on the ice definitely we were on our heels a lot and it was really intense I felt like every time I went out there I was just a little shaky because I felt like I was just getting like pummeled with dumpins and things like that yeah is it one of those games where the score doesn't really reflect how close the game was because if I think if you look at the WCHA final you see the overtime and then you look at the game in the frozen four and it's three to one I guess like is it one of those situations um, yeah, I would say in a certain aspect, I would say it was still close, but I think um, they didn't capitalize on their opportunities. They got as much as we did, and when we got them, we took advantage of them, thank God, which was awesome, but they're definitely a good team, and it's always super close with them, but I think given how hard we worked and things this year, I definitely think we did deserve to win the game. You then played Northeastern in the national championship game. Uh how do you prepare for playing Erin Frankel? Because she's obviously the Patty Kazmaier Award winner. She's one of the best goalies in the country. How do you prepare for a goalie like that? And how did you prepare for Northeastern uh, before the game? Yeah, I think um, in terms of Erin, she's literally an awesome goalie. And she stands on her head all the time. But I think just getting shots on her, obviously Daryl's goal um, was pretty cool and pretty surreal. But I think it just goes to show that like little bounces and trick plays and things like that are the only way you can really get around her sometimes and you have to make her move and kind of get screens and things to throw in front of her like point blank opportunities where she can see the puck aren't going to go in because she's so good so just moving her and using your ability and talent to get those trick shots like Daryl did and things like that pays off and then um, kind of just something we talked about was just being aware of their you know defense joining the rush and things like that like Duluth does like Skylar Fontaine's really good and loves to play offense. So just being aware of that because it's really a fourth man forward for them. So that's kind of just our big stressor before the game was just being aware of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I guess like, um, did you, you guys were really physical in that game from my memory? Like there was some good uh, b uh, physical play. Is that something you guys like emphasized uh, before the game against Northeastern? No, honestly, I think it just kind of came with, the championship intensity and things like that. I think emotions get high and bodies get thrown around. And uh, I think it just comes with the championship caliber of the tournament. But I don't think there's really any sort of aspect where we talked about, you know, playing the body more or anything like that. Yeah. And did, would you, were you happy with the refs, like kind of swallowing the whistle during that game? Yeah, it definitely made it more fun to play. I think it's easy to call those things, especially in girls hockey. But just being able to play through it and just let the kids play it out however they feel, unless it's a blatantly obvious call, is uh, definitely more fun for us. And I think it makes it more fun for everyone else watching too. Do you think uh, hitting should be allowed in women's hockey? Um, uh, I would say open ice hitting still no, but I feel like in the men's league, they've kind of started to get rid of that as well. But I think hitting along the wall and stuff like that, I think definitely – um, they've loosened up a bit, not as much as the men, but I think definitely that's something I would be interested in, you know, adding to the women's game because I feel like we're 
strong, like strong in the corners and stuff like that. And it'd be nice to put a body on somebody once in a while. Definitely. Yeah. Like in the first period, I think Dara Watts threw a body and it was just cool to see. And it seemed like your bench got fired up after that hit. Yeah. I definitely think hits can be momentum changers and you can definitely gain a lot of confidence too on the ice and things like that. So I think definitely adding it to our game would bring a different level of energy and a component that we don't really have. Now, how did you handle the nerves of that game? Because obviously you're fighting for a national championship, but you also want to like treat it like any other game so you don't uh, get too caught up in the moment. Yeah, I think just being distracted all day was my biggest thing. And um, Coach Johnson kind of talked about like managing your emotions and your adrenaline. Like you don't want to have adrenaline at two o'clock when the game's not until seven or eight o'clock. So just being distracted, you know, napping and things like that, they can be hard to do um, given the circumstances. But um, you kind of have to force yourself to do it. But I think after the experience freshman year, I wasn't really nervous going into the game just because I knew it wasn't another game and I trusted our team and had confidence. And I felt like nerves were just going to get the best of me. So I just avoided them as much as I could. Now you, you were tied in the third period. What was the message heading in uh, in the locker room when you were going into overtime? Yeah, surprisingly, actually, in the locker room, we just remember talking to each other and we were like, we got this, like, we just need one bounce and we're fine. Like, there was no nerves. Nobody was really, like, super energetic to the point where they were, like, getting shaky and, you know, making everybody else nervous or anything like that. It was pretty calm and we were just hydrating, eating and doing things like that. And it was nice to have a really calming presence. I feel like it's easy to get complacent and get nervous in between periods like that, knowing the stakes, but it was nice to have a really calming presence in there. Now, Dara Watts obviously got that insane overtime winning goal. What was your reaction to that goal? Because watching it, I didn't even realize it went in. It was kind of like a funky bounce. And then, like, it was basically like I was watching it. And then, like, the entire team just jumped out of the bench and celebrated. It was kind of odd. Yeah, I was on the ice. And I actually – I saw it go in. And then I saw her start skating towards me. And she threw her gloves and stick. And I was looking at her, like, did that really just go in? And then I know Lacey dropped her gloves and stick. And in the one picture – everyone's coming off the bench and I'm still looking at Daryl with my stick and my gloves in my hand. Like, I don't know what I was doing, but I just couldn't process it that it went in, but I did see it go in. I think I was just kind of in shock, but um, not surprised that Daryl put that one in and had the idea to do that. So it's pretty yeah. special, but definitely something I would anticipate from her. Yeah, I know. It was kind of weird because when I was watching it, I only realized when it went in was when the defensemen kind of like put their hands in their face and I was like, oh, wow, I guess Wisconsin won. It was kind of cool, though. I kind of like that. Yeah, it was pretty special. I think that goal just shows her skill, honestly. It kind of just sums it up for everybody, like how talented she is and how well she sees the ice to think of something like that. Now, she's coming back next year, right? Yeah. How excited are you to have her back for another year? Super excited. Um, obviously, she has the ability to go uh, be centralized with Team Canada and obviously super excited for her and proud of her if she does do that. And I definitely think it's something that she deserves to do as well. And hopefully the year after that, that she'll be back in Madison for another year with me will be super fun. And she's super talented and special. So anytime that she gets to stay with us, I'm super excited for that. Now I want to transition a little bit and talk about the beginning of your hockey career. So you're from Illinois. How did you start playing hockey and falling in love with the sport? Um, my brother and my dad played growing up, so I kind of just piggybacked uh, off my brother, and uh, he was always at the rink with my dad and stuff, and so I kind of was always at the rink with them, and then I wanted to try it and obviously compete with him, and the brother-sister rivalry kind of took over from there. Are you the youngest? Yeah, just my brother and I. My brother's 24, and uh, he went and played hockey at Michigan State just club, but he played his whole life, too. Did you ever get picked on by him since you, he was the older brother? Oh, yeah, for sure. I definitely built up some of my character, I think, from him for sure on the ice. No, I definitely understand. I'm the younger sibling as well, so it's something you kind of have to deal with being the younger sibling. Oh, yeah. It, it's fun at times, and others it kind of stinks, especially when you're younger. Mm -hmm. I think, like, when you're a kid, it gets you really annoyed. But, like, once you get older, at least from my perspective, I start, I'm sort of used to it, so it doesn't really bother me as much. Yeah, I would agree, um, especially now seeing him, like, you know, having to start getting a job and things like that. You kind of sit back and you're like, oh, thank God I'm younger. I can watch you do all this now. Yeah, definitely. Now, who was your favorite player growing up? Ooh, um, from the men's side or from the women's side? Uh, both. 
Oh, um, I think growing up for me was Jonathan Taze and Patrick Kane. I feel like those are two t typical Chicago answers, I guess. But um, just like seeing them and see how well they did. And they won so many cups when I was younger. So they're always really special players to watch. And I grew up a huge Blackhawks fan. So I feel like those are typical Blackhawks answers, but I don't know what else. And yeah. then um, from the women's side, I would say – um, former Badger Madison Packer and then Alex Brigsby or Cavallini now I should say but um, definitely I went to camps and things like that growing up and they were two people that I kind of clung to when I was younger and uh, kind of learned from them and asked them so many questions I'm sure I was annoying as a little kid at like Wisconsin camps picking their brains but um, they definitely were two people I clung to for sure. Now, as a Blackhawks fan, how cool was it to see them win those cups and also make me very upset as a Bruins fan uh, when you guys beat us that year? That was not that was not a good memory for me, but I'm assuming it's the opposite for you. Yeah, it was so special. I think um, it was just crazy. My family actually was watching all together, and my uncle had a radio in his hand, actually. So he heard the call of the game before we saw it um, on the TV, and he was kind of jumping up and down and um, it's set in from there, but we all went to the parade every year. They won and things like that. And it definitely was special growing up, seeing so many teams win between the Blackhawks, the White Sox, the Cubs, and things like that. Yeah, I know when Dave Bowen scored that goal, it was one of the most devastating moments. I think I was like 11 when it happened, and oh, it was awful. And especially yeah, since it was like, pretty surreal. Yeah, no, I feel like people like obviously we're spoiled as Boston sports fans, but I think it's more of a Patriots thing because like the other teams like, you know, like Celtics haven't won in quite some time. Same with the Bruins now. So I think it's more of a Patriots thing when people think about Boston sports. Yeah, I feel like it's just crazy to think that it happened so quick and you don't really think in a hockey game that that's even possible given how many people on the ice and how much work it takes to get pucks in the net usually. But yeah. that was just crazy, like five minutes. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Now, uh, before Wisconsin, you played for the mission. Uh, How did you get the opportunity to play there? Yeah, um, I transitioned there from boys, actually. And um, they kind of uh, – or the boys coach I played with, Kevin Mann, had a connection at the mission and wound up starting their 2000s team once the 2000s were eligible to play AAA and kind of um, talk to the coaches there and um, influenced us to come over there and, uh, Katie Sipron and I, who we played boys together and she's actually on Northeastern who we just played, but, uh, we went there together and started playing there. So. Yeah. You get to play with a lot of D1 commits because I was checking the mission roster over the years. They had Tatum Skaggs, who's with Ohio state, Val Caldwell, who played for Vermont and then Ella Huber, who's a commitment to Minnesota. What's it like playing with all those D1 commits at the same team? Yeah, it was it was just crazy to think how much talent we had on our high school teams and um, especially at the mission. I know my junior year, I think our roster, I want to say it was like 21 or 22 and there are 18 of us, I think, going D1. So um, obviously we lost to Shattuck still and Brett and uh, Nat on my team, but it definitely was crazy to think how much talent we had on one roster given, you know, you go to college and have all this talent too, but we definitely had a special group in high school. Is there like a mission Shattuck rivalry at Wisconsin? Um, I think when they play each other, like in youth hockey and we like know about it, I think definitely there's a little bit, like I obviously root for, um, the mission, but, um, growing up losing to them just about every time when it mattered in the national championship kind of stunk and we laugh about it now, but, um, definitely would have liked to beat them one of those years. Now, how did the mission help prepare you for college hockey? Um, I would say the biggest thing was just like, uh, Tony Catchy, who I played for at the mission, just having an impact on me off the ice and um, preaching, you know, good habits, like prioritizing your time and things like that. I think at the mission, there was so much time for us to be worried about what was going on at the rink and how much time the rink consumed in our lives. But um, they kind of just forced us to, you know, come to the rink and have a study table and get our work done and things like that, which made it easier at Wisconsin because we still have to do academics and things like that. So um, being able to manage our time definitely was probably the biggest factor that helped uh, make my transition easier. You also won a gold medal for Team USA in the world uh, in the U18 championships. I guess like what was it like representing your country and winning that medal? Yeah, that was really special. Obviously, an opportunity to represent your country um, for anything is always going to be really special, and I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity. But that was definitely a moment of my career I think I'll never forget, especially with my family being there and things like that. 
Um, it was so special and it was something I definitely dreamed of as a little kid. And I can't believe, I still can't believe in some ways that it finally came true and happened. And obviously I'd love the opportunity to do it again if it were to present itself to me. Now, what was your recruitment process like and why did you choose to go to Wisconsin? Um, oh, my recruitment process. I feel like my recruiting was definitely the same. Um, just, you know, uh, you emailing coaches wanting to go to camps, them reaching out to you, typical thing growing up. But I think um, the biggest factor in going there was definitely being from Chicago. My grandparents never missed hockey games for me in Chicago and my parents. And, um, you know, having my grandparents at every – they've never missed a game at Lebon until this year. So um, that was definitely a big factor for me was just like my grandparents and my family always being able to be up there was a huge thing for me. Yeah, and I guess you also get to play under Mark Johnson. What's it like playing under a legendary coach like that? And does he ever talk about the miracle on ice? Because I feel like I would ask him a ton of questions about that. Yeah, it, it's unbelievable every day just, you know, seeing his daily habits and things. He is a creature of habit, and he does the thing, same things every day, which teaches you a lot about, you know, what you do. But um, he definitely, like the miracle thing is just beyond comprehension sometimes to think like that was really – you know, he was really there and things. But um, at Duluth, the one day last year, we actually played Friday, Sunday, because uh, Amistel Arena was hosting the uh, men's uh, Minnesota high school championship. So his wife actually said, because um, it was, a, I think last year was the 40th anniversary, I want to say. Yeah. And his wife said, you know, you should sit down with the girls and the team and uh, let them talk to you about it. Like, you never talk about it. And he'll never say a word about it. And she kind of provoked him to be like, okay, like I'll let them talk to me about it. So he kind of said on Saturday on our day off, you know, if anyone wants to sit down here and pick my brain about it, please do. And kind of walked us through it. And we must have sat down there for three or four hours. And that was like one of the best moments of my career. But now if you say to him, like, that was one of the best moments of my career, just being able to pick your brain about it, he'll be like, oh, no way. Like mm -hmm. he just kind of deflects it, but that's the humble person he is. He doesn't really like to talk about that kind of stuff, but it was definitely really cool to hear about it. Yeah, is it cool watching that movie? Like, because he's introduced in, like, the movie, like, in towards, like, the 20 or 25-minute mark where it's, like, Mark Johnston, uh, Wisconsin. Is it kind of cool, kind of cool seeing that part because you know the actual person? Yeah, I think after I got here and I was in my dorm, I, like, rewatched the movie, and I was like, wow, this is, like, insane, <laughs> like, being on the ice with them and stuff now. And I feel like I was, like, a little kid in a candy store, like, just thinking when I went to the rink the next day, like, oh, my God, like, mm -hmm. that guy's, like, standing here, the guy. And it, it's just – it's surreal. And then, you know, you walk around him every day, even like when we were in Erie at the tournament, there's people like waiting outside our bus, wanting his autograph, wanting to talk to him and um, being the, like getting the honor and privilege to be around him every day and hang out with him and stuff is definitely really special. Now, are some of the stories in that movie true, like Jim Craig with the test and with the, uh, I forgot, uh, Rob McClanahan, where you like kind of left the locker room? Uh, because he like hurt his leg and then her Brooks like yelled at him to like get back on the ice are those stories true or do they like exaggerate them for the movie um he kind of went over all that I couldn't honestly give you an answer on like those exact things but he went over certain aspects of the movie there was definitely people who were like was this part of the movie true and things like that I couldn't give you an exact detail but he definitely went over some parts that like were different some parts mm -hmm. that like um were exactly the same and um, just like the pressure of the coach and like them skating and so much so often that stuff was all really real and he definitely made an emphasis on that but the little details I couldn't exactly tell you what he said. Now in your freshman year you won a national championship uh, one thing that impressed me about this national championship win was your goalie Kristen Campbell didn't allow a single goal throughout the entire tournament. Uh, talk about the impact that she had on your team that year and just talk about winning your first national title at Quinnipiac. Yeah, she was awesome and um, definitely the backbone of our team that whole tournament and I think just speaks volumes about her habits and things. Going into the tournament, I know she was so prepared and so confident. It definitely showed um, having a shutout every game and I don't think that's something that's easy to do by any means, but um, she definitely brought leadership in the locker room and was very vocal and expressed so much confidence in us and especially being a freshman, that was super helpful to hear that from her. And uh, at Quinnipiac, that was my first time ever there, actually. So I never went out there and uh, visited there, but I think it was really special. The rink's obviously beautiful on the inside, but um, it was nice to win there and obviously have some great memories there my first time. 
And you got a lot of leaders on that team that like Annie Pankowski, Sophia Shaver, what's it like being a freshman and getting to learn under those great players at such a young age? Yeah, it was awesome. I think definitely that uh, whole leadership, obviously not everyone can wear a letter, but I think letters and uh, for that senior class could go all the way around. They're all leaders in their own way. And I think especially like Annie and Clark get a huge impact on us and all the freshmen um, just learning from them and they're being such like elite athletes. And I know they're older than us and things like that. And they're ma more mature, but just being able to learn from them every day was really nice. So I want to transition now. And we're now in a segment I like to call the non-hockey segment where I ask you some non-hockey questions. Uh, my first question to you is who is the funniest on the team? Ooh, um, I would have to say probably Daryl, honestly. Um, otherwise, Britta Curl. Britta definitely has a bold personality and is not afraid to, you know, laugh and poke fun and things like that. And she definitely brings a lot of laughs to the locker room. Now, what's your thoughts on Daryl Watts' new Instagram and how is, why is she not verified yet? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm finally happy that she's broke out on Instagram. Uh, yeah, honestly, the verified topic, she needs to be verified. She's like literally so goaded at this point. So she definitely needs to get verified and Instagram definitely needs to get on that as soon as possible. Definitely, definitely. Is that the best first post uh, you've ever seen? Because I don't think I could top that. Just have the national title, game winning goal, all that stuff. It was a, it was a great post. Yeah, and definitely I think the last picture of the hit and then uh, the mm -hmm. caption I think was, was this good? And it just sums it up. It was perfect. I don't, I don't think there's a better first instant than that. Definitely not. Now, who has the best style on the team? Obviously you do, but we have to give other your teammates love, I guess. Oh, style on the ice or style off the ice? Both. Everyone, there was a lot of, I, I guess, like, talking to some of your teammates, there's a lot of a variety when it comes to style. You guys are a, a very good, stylish team. Yeah, I would say our team off the ice definitely is very stylish. I would say, um, oh, I would say style, I would say Grace Bowlby, probably, or Tegan Grant um, off the ice. And on the ice, I would say, oh, that's a tough one. I would say maybe Sophie Shirley. Mm -hmm. on the ice I feel like she has pretty good style I feel like um Maddie Wheeler also has pretty good style um and then in terms of goalies I would say Cammy has probably the best style now uh who is the best trash talker on the team and what's the best trip you've ever heard from that player Ooh, I would say the best trash talker on the team is probably me I usually <laughs> like to throw stuff around during the games um Chirps are definitely the most fun for me. But um, other than that, I would say Britta. She loves to get into it and definitely um, loves to use her mouth and things like that, like I do, especially during the Gopher games. I feel like we know so many of them, so it's easy to pick fun at everybody. Now, are you more of a bubble or cage helmet wearer? A cage. Cage for sure. I never worn a bubble, and I don't plan on it. Thank God with COVID they didn't make us like hockey East, so that was nice. Yeah, what's what's the why do you, what, what why don't you like the bubble? Because I I wear the bubble. I personally I think it's easier to see. I don't know. I just feel like it's so like it just looks like so restricting and like claustrophobic. And I don't know. I've always worn a cage my whole life. I've never made the transition or tried it. So I guess don't knock it till you try it. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think I can do it. Now, what music do you like to listen to, and what fires up the team before a game? Like, which road arena has the best? I guess warm up mix. I'm curious about that um usually every team honestly whoever's like running the radio or whatever it is in the rink has just plays something and they know away teams usually have a mix this year we did have a mix that we got made um by one of the djs at one of the bars um in madison which was really cool we like dm them and asked and um so i would say our warm-up mix without bias i think was still ours and a lot of other teams even liked ours so um and then before the game Ooh, our team will listen to like Black Eyed Peas a lot, um, some throwback stuff and definitely stuff that we all knew the words to to get us pumped up. Yeah, like when you're not off the ice or when you're off the ice, do you listen to like more hip hop, um, country, anything like in particular? Or is it all um, kind of the same when you... Yeah, I would definitely say country off the ice. I feel like practice days and things like that, we all listen to country and I feel like country is a pretty likable thing for pretty much anyone away from the rink especially towards the end of the summertime and our spring hockey stuff now I love listening to country music new school country or old school country 
A mm, little bit of both. Depends on who, I guess. Depends how slow and stuff. But I think like Luke Combs and even like some of those slow songs I really like. Now, um, if you could have lunch with anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Oh, goodness. That's a loaded question. Okay. Um, hmm. I, I guess I'll know. go first. I'll start like, uh, I would say probably like Jack Eichel. I think that would be cool to talk with him because he's one of my favorite hockey players. And I think he has, he's, I think he gets underrated a lot. And I'm curious to hear how he deals with being with the Buffalo Sabres. Yeah, I think like <laughs> the Sabres, that's true. Um, oh gosh, I don't know. I feel like, mm, I would say in terms of hockey, I feel like a hockey player, I would have to say, probably taste just because I grew up like watching him and loving him and I'd love to get to talk to him and whatever but um I think away from the rink in terms of like a celebrity probably like a country singer like Luke Combs and I don't know I feel like it'd be fun to talk about or talk to them and hear them sing in real life I think for me for celebrity probably like a comedian like Pete Davidson just because I want a good laugh when you're at lunch or something like that so yeah. I think, so I think like that would, that would be someone I would go to lunch with yeah, that's a good one. I feel like you could definitely play that angle, too, because they're easy to talk to. Definitely, definitely. They'll roast you, which would be funny for me. So yeah. I'll, I'll definitely – that's what I would personally choose. Now, another non-hockey question. What's your favorite TV show? Like, what have you been binging lately? Because you've been, like, kind of flying around, mm-hmm. being in quarantine, obviously, because I know you're in the bubble in Erie. So, like, what have you been watching a lot? Um, I would say All-American. I – um. I don't know, the new season is out, though, so that's only once a week right now. Um, besides that, I don't know, I love to st- skip around kind of on Disney+, Plus, kind of those throwback movies, and then there's that new uh, Clemson football player movie, I forget the name of it, that's on there. That's actually really good if you haven't watched it. No, I've heard about it. I haven't watched it. I, am a, I like Disney Plus a lot. I think it's starting to get a little better than Netflix. I know that might be yeah. a hot, hot opinion, but I think some of the movies they have are a little bit better, but... All American. I've not never watched it, but I've heard it's good. And I know that's the character Spencer. Like everyone asks me, like how angry is he? Like, cause is that like yeah. his thing? Like he gets angry all the time. Yeah, he does in the show. It's definitely a great show. I highly recommend. Nice. I'll definitely watch it sometime. Uh, so back to some hockey questions now. Uh, what should be done to help grow women's hockey, in your opinion? Um. I think kind of navigating um, the playing field that they are right now, just going around towns and being able to showcase it. I think the PWHPA is doing a great job of skipping around cities and getting it on TV platforms and things like that, which has been super difficult over the last few years. But um, them getting coverage and uh, playing out like MSG in the United Center and things like that, like those are big time places and people kind of notice when those events are taking place. So it's good that that's happening and it would be nice if they could get around, you know, to all the leagues in the NHL and things like that, just so the young girls that are there can see it happening at the ring, I think yeah. is the biggest thing. Yeah. There's a, everyone was saying like how a lot of people in women's hockey want kind of like one uniform league, like back by the NHL, because there's obviously a lot of players either go to Europe, they go to the NWHL or they go to the PWHPA. I guess like if, if how does a player make that decision, which league to go to? Yeah, honestly, I don't know. Like, I feel like I know um, I gradu- er, graduated. Um, Maddie Rolf has graduated in my freshman year, and she went over and played overseas, and then now she plays in the PWHPA. So I feel like it kind of depends. Like, I feel like one driving aspect of going overseas is just being able to travel for a little while. I know um, on her time off, she enjoyed just traveling with the girls and seeing places in Europe. So I definitely think that's a uh, motivating force to go over there. But other than that, I feel like, I don't know how you navigate if you're really indecisive about playing here or not. I feel like it depends on the year and how things are going. And obviously, given the pandemic, like this year has been hard. And uh, over there, I don't think it's been any easier. But I think they have gotten in more games overseas, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, no, I don't I, I've Some players have gone overseas. It seems a bit different because, like, I know in some places, like, masks are, like, not, like, a thing just because, like, they want to do, like, the – herd immunity thing so I I think it's definitely much different in Europe I've I haven't heard anything about it I haven't haven't really paid attention to it but from a player I know who played in Norway he said it was like completely different yeah I know um at camp Megan Bozak actually got back from um overseas from playing uh, a couple days before camp and came home did the testing and quarantine and everything and um it sounded like from 
what she was saying and things like that, that I was hearing that everything over there was kind of almost getting back to normal unless I was mishearing. So I feel like it's just kind of different on the country. And even like in the U S I feel like at this point, the state, like every state is so different and, you know, masks and things like that. When we went up to um, Blaine for the camp, you had to wear your masks to the bench under your cage then take the helmet off, take the mask off and then put your helmet back on on the bench. So, and obviously at the NCAA tournament, our games, we never had to wear them to the bench. So I feel like it just kind of depends right now. Yeah, definitely. It's just, it's a bit weird navigating it. So I know like, I know in New Zealand, it's like all back to normal and it's like watching like, cause they have like rugby games with like full fans. Oh, and it's, wow. it's cool. That it's kind of, it makes me jealous. Cause I'm like, I want just the normalcy to come back. So yeah. no, I definitely agree with you. It's kind of weird how it's different everywhere. Yeah, I, I, the uniformity, I think, definitely drives me nuts just because I want everything to be back to normal and not everyone's on the same page, so it definitely gets frustrating, but obviously I feel like everyone's frustrated at this point. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you on that. I guess, like, what advice would you give younger players trying to pursue a Division One college hockey scholarship? Yeah, I would say just have fun. I think having fun is the biggest thing. I feel like especially at college, um, you know, people think it's silly to say, like, oh, you know, what, what helps you every day. And it's just having fun and making going to the rink fun. And I think that's something that's definitely overlooked and um, it can become a chore and a task when you don't want to go to the rink and you have to lift and do everything every day. But when you're having fun, it's not a chore and it makes, you know, working hard and um, staying out and shooting after and things like that, that much better and that much easier to do when you're having fun and you want to be out there. Well, do you have any shout outs you'd like to give to your teammates? I know you shouted out a few of them, but is there anyone that I might have missed? No, I, I think my only thing that would say is uh, shout out to Daryl. We got to get her verified on Instagram one of these days. Definitely, definitely. I'll try to, I don't know anyone from Instagram. I'll look into <laughs> it. I'll reach out. I'll do my best and do my part. And I know everyone that listening will do it. And then we'll pressure Instagram a little bit. And I think they'll definitely yeah. get that blue check mark. For sure. Do you have a blue check mark? I do not. I do not anticipate ever getting one. But oh, you're gonna get one. I see it. And if you're th- if two-time national champion, should get a uh, blue check marks in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, if only. If mm-hmm. only. Does anyone in your team have a blue check mark? I'm curious about that. I'm trying to think. Um, no, I don't think anyone on our roster currently has one. I know people that graduated all the PWHPA people got check marks and things like that, but I don't think anyone currently on our roster has one. Oh, I'm just curious about that. Well, thank you again, Nicole, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. You're a great defenseman, great player, but you're also a better player off the ice. And I just want to let you know that. And you're one of my favorite players to watch in college hockey. So yes, I also want to let you. you that. So take care, stay safe, and I wish you all the best. You too. Thank you so much. No problem. I just have like one.